Okay, so this morning as a church, we want to be a discipleship church teaching on evangelism. We're looking at the spiritual gifts this uh, year on our last Sunday of each month. And as you can see, the children have all got VIP seats at the front here with their cakes. Um, to get to the point of evangelism, which is what we'll get to, I just want to break some things down for all of us in the room this morning. Because I'm sure we all know what evangelism is, and we all know how to be evangelists. But I just want to put some stuff in the background that would help us all get to that point. So number one, what is the gospel? Come on, everyone involved, come on, put some hands up. Tell me what you think the gospel is. Jeremy. Before I thought it was gossip. Gossip. (laughs) (laughs) Nearly. So he said before. Yeah, before. What have we got behind you yet? What's we thinking? Perfect. Good news. Anyone else? Yeah? The Word of God. The Word of God. That's good. What about yourself? (laughs) I forgot. Sorry? I forgot. You forgot? Really? (laughs) One more? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Oh, the Gospels. That's good. Well done. And Jeremy, last one? Good Friday, not quite, but good idea. You see, the gospel is the good news. Gospel songs, we praise to God or Jesus, the greatest love story ever told, and the story of Christ's birth, death and resurrection, all told in the gospel books. Now, Elim is actually, I think Teresa mentioned it earlier, which is really good because we haven't even talked about it. Elim is a movement and it, it is called the Elim Four Square Gospel Alliance. And the question is, why is it called the Four Square Gospel Alliance? Well, it's because Elim and Elim churches and Elim pastors and people who are part of Elim church believe in four key things. Number one, that Jesus is the saviour. Yeah. yeah. Number two, that Jesus is the baptiser in the spirit and in the flesh, i.e. water baptisms. We also believe that Jesus is the one who heals. Yeah. And we also believe that Jesus is the coming king. They're the four key things that Elam are are, are believing and we agree with here as a church. So John 3.16. I'm going to whiz through this this morning, okay? I'm not going to spend hours on stuff because we could spend days and weeks preaching this. I'm just going to whiz through some key points. So what is the gospel? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And C.S. Lewis said, the son of God became man, so he could enable men to become sons of God. Um, N.T. Wright, a famous theologian, said, the gospel is the royal announcement that the crucified and risen Jesus who died for our sins and rose again according to the scriptures, has been enthroned as the true Lord of the world. When this gospel is preached, God calls people to salvation out of sheer grace, leading them to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as the risen Lord. So that gives us an idea of what the gospel is. So the gospel is the announcement that God's kingdom has come in life, death, death and resurrection through Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, in the fulfilment of the scriptures in the Old Testament. The gospel evokes faith, repentance and discipleship. Its accompanying effects include salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the gospel is in two minutes. Okay. Next question is, what is an evangelical? Come on. Come on, anyone know what you are? Go on then, Deborah. Someone who preaches the gospel. Someone who preaches the gospel. Yes, mate? They go for evangelism. They go out in evangelism, yeah? Yeah, that's good. Was that a hand at the back there I saw? <coughs> Just resting. <laughs> What have you got, Jeremy? Man of God? Preach out the gospel. Preach out the gospel. Okay, so I think you're all right. God didn't create, first of all, God didn't create us to compete with one another. He created us to complement one another. So when you look to the person to your left or right, go, I'm not in competition with you. I'm actually here to make you better. 
And you're here to make me better. <laughs> to be an evangelical, so we already know what the gospel is, children. Everyone's a child of Christ. What is an evangelical? Well, an evangelical believes in a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things. Some of it is actually irrelevant, if you ask me. Some of it is just religion. But the key five things that evangelicals believe in is what? That the, the Bible is the most important book that we have. And the Bible is truth. Okay? Number two is that Jesus is the Son of God. Now you'd be surprised to hear that 45% of our country believes in the resurrection. What's the resurrection, Jeremy? Sorry, I sprung that one on you. It's the good news. Amen. The resurrection is when Jesus came back to life again. Easter Monday. Yeah. And yet, so 45% of people believe in the resurrection in our country. But only 20% of our country actually believe that Jesus is God. Interesting. We also believe that the cross took place, that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. We believe that conversion is required, that people have to be in a place of repentance, i.e. we have to say sorry, like Izzy got us all to pray this morning, that repentance prayer, we are sorry, I think Jeremy prayed it, forgive us for our sins. And we make you our saviour. That is conversion. And then the fifth one, which is often one that we forget, is activism. Activism means to go and share the good news with other people. That is what we are called as evangelicals to do. And we live in a country where our attitude to Jesus is changing. People still understand who God is, understand who the Holy Spirit is, but struggle to believe that Jesus is the universal saviour. While the church and Christians still promote this, the world is looking for other solutions. Next one for you. What is a Pentecostal? These are tough questions this morning, aren't they? Go for it. Something to do with the Pentecost? Yeah. Amen. Really good. You're on fire today. <laughs> yeah, but... Yes, go for it. Not quite, but you're, well, yeah, I suppose it is. Book of Acts 2, yeah. Go for it. Oh, wait, isn't someone that's been baptized with fire? Oh, that guy is burning today. He's on fire. See, Pentecostals are effectively evangelicals, so evangelical people, but we also put a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Okay? And it comes from the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, when the, the Holy Spirit came upon them and in them. Something which, generally speaking, beforehand the Spirit was around, but from that day the Holy Spirit was very much in us. And who gave us the Holy Spirit? Jesus did, because he said, I am leaving you, but I'm going to give you a gift far greater, uh, which will be there with you till the end of time, the Holy Spirit. You see, we should be all as Pentecostals, be in a place to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And one of the ways that we can often recognise that is through the speaking in tongues. This week we've had an incredible time of worship and prayer in the prayer rooms and on Zoom. And quite often people will just start speaking in tongues. Can people speak in tongues in this room? Yeah. Yeah. Can children speak in tongues? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Absolutely. And also, we are very much believing in faith healings. Yeah, we believe that Jesus heals as well, through the Holy Spirit. And again, I can go on, there's so much goodness of the Pentecostal, and what it means to be a Pentecostal, but that's just to give us a quick oversight. So, first of all, we have the Gospel, which is good news. Then we have evangelicals, who are people who are carriers of the good news. Um, and then we have Pentecostals, who are activist of the good news through the Holy Spirit working within us. Then, and this is all really important because once we understand those simple things, guys, we then understand how we can then start looking at what is evangelism. What's evangelism? 
Go for it. Baptism. Baptism. Interesting. Do you know that? When you tell people about God. When you tell people about God and Jesus. Yeah. Anyone else? Any scholars in the room would like to give me something that would blow my socks off this morning? Reaching out to lost souls. Reaching out to lost souls. That's really good. What I thought was walking with people into faith. Walking with people into faith, good. Yep. Yeah. So teaching people about the gospel. Teaching people about the gospel. Really good stuff. Well done, everyone. You guys are on fire this morning as well. You know, the word evangelism, the English word evangelism, is rooted in the Greek word evangelon, which also means good news. So we are carriers and sharers of the good news. And I believe there are three key types of evangelism for us all to get into our minds today. Number one is eternal evangelism. And there's three different types of eternal. Sometimes I feel that before I can go out on the streets and tell everyone about Jesus, I need to know inside myself what I actually believe. Does anyone else feel like that? You know, we need that confidence to believe what we say. I can't be an expert in something if I don't actually learn about it. Does anyone else feel like that? These guys can't play instruments. I was gifted today with a triangle to play a triangle. And yet, the problem is... You still can't play. The problem is, let's be honest, how does one play a triangle? Not like that. Isn't that right? Ah, oh, there's some great YouTube videos on triangle playing. But isn't that sound so much better? Yeah. When you're in tune. Yeah. Oh, I want to try. I want to try. I want to try. I I better not because I'll get told off. Um, you see, when we learn how to do something internally, that really then helps us have the confidence to go and share it externally. Now, there's three ideas eternally. One day, uh, there's three beliefs. One is that we have to understand the idea of what evangelism is, i.e. beliefs are based on experiences and worldviews. The second thing that we have to process is the images, specific pictures and memories that we have gained about sharing evangelism. And then thirdly is feelings. What are our passions and our desires about Jesus? So number one, what is our idea about Jesus? Number two is what is our image about Jesus? And number three is, what is our feelings about Jesus? And spiritual transformation only happens as each of these dimensions transformed into Christ-likeness. Now, let us look. Has anyone got a Bible with them this morning who wants to read out? Anyone good at reading? Anyone else other than Jeremy? (laughs) Go on then, Jemima. Have you got your Bible? Or do you need a Bible? You need a Bible. What do you mean you never come to church without a Bible? <laughs> come on, Ada. Can you read uh, from chapter 4, in Genesis 4, from verse 1, all the way uh, to verse 9? So just down here to there, okay? Now, Adam knew, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of, sh- of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and of their far portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. But the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching out the door. Its, des- its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when... They were in the field, Cain rose against the brother of Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. I, am I my brother's keeper? Excellent. 
Thank you, well done, Jemima. Yay. Good reading there. So we see the story of Cain and Abel there, and what we see is, imagine your own image. What is your idea of God? Who is God to you? Um, can you trust God? Is he someone that is uh, good to you? Is he, what is the image of God in your life? Um, and how do you feel about God before we can go and tell others? Now, when we look at the story of Cain, we see the story that he is not that keen to share his first and best offerings, is he? Because maybe he has, he's a bit jealous of his brother Abel. So when we look at the image, uh, sorry, the idea that Cain has of God, he can't trust God to meet his needs. He's not in that place where he can truly let, say, let go and let God run his life and look after his life. Yeah? He still wants to put, hold some of the um, control to him. Whereas Abel was willing to give his best over and put all of his faith into God. You see, the image of Cain for God, he was competing against his brother. He wanted to be better than his brother. And that was what his focus was. And then his feelings, he longed for superiority and acceptance. All things which meant that he had a hard heart towards God. And when we look at that, some of us can be in that place where we're trying to put us in control or we're trying to put us above God. So if that's the case this morning, how can we then be expected to go and tell people of the care and grace and love of Jesus if we don't really know in our hearts who Jesus is because we're more interested about how much we're going to get? Just like Izzy shared on the chocolates this morning. If she wants to hold on to the chocolates, that's her choice. But then how can we expect her to go and share her chocolates if she's not willing to share her chocolates. That's a deep thought that is, isn't it? So the first thing is we have to get right in evangelism is ourselves. We have to know in our heart who God is and what he means to every one of us and our hearts before we can expect to go and tell others. Then we have number two, personal evangelism. Uh, number two is personal evangelism. And that is described as one-on-one -on -one conversations. And it's the activity of presenting the gospel to another person with the intent of seeing them come to Jesus as well. And I love the story. Has anyone ever heard of Christine Kane? Yeah. From A21 and various other ministries. Australian lady, incredible lady. Do you know how she came to faith? She went one day, Jane John was in Australia... J. John. Everyone know who J. John is? Yes. Famous English evangelist. He was in Australia and he was asked to go and have a coffee with this rowdy young lady who was wanting to find out more about faith. So he went and had a coffee with Christine Kay in a public place and he had a conversation with her. Apparently, two coffees later, she then made a commitment to follow Jesus. Just because J. John sat down with her and listened to her and explained what the gospel was. That is personal um, evangelism. That is something that we can all do is we might know somebody who is so far away from God and so anti-Jesus and yet they're probably up for a Costa coffee any day or a Cafe Everdar coffee any day. Yeah? And that's the thing. What does it take for us to go and sit with someone, listen to them and then tell them a little bit about the gospel? How many of you, um, when we look at the generation, uh, different generations, we go from the builders generation to the baby boomers generation, to generation X, generation Y, then me around about generation Z, and then we have generation alpha. Okay, these are all different generation age groups that have been defined as categories. Now interestingly, the Generation Z, i.e. the people in the late 90s and early noughties, are feeling more and more frustrated with dating apps. Do you know 90% of Generation Z people are now turning off our dating apps because they're frustrated with it. Young people are returning to a desire to build in-person relationships. Yeah? <clears throat> That's just the same as Jesus as far as I'm concerned. There's some great apps out there. There's some great tools out there to tell people about Jesus. 
But the most powerful thing that you and I have in this room, if we choose to, is our own testimony. Is our way of sharing the gospel is brilliant. And how you share your testimony is far greater than I could ever imagine of me sharing mine. You see, there are seven questions. These are the most Googled questions about faith. Might be worth even if you've got to make a note of it, because someone might ask you one of these questions. And do you have the answer to these? Remember, we're in personal evangelism now, guys. You might find it in the school playground. Someone might ask you a question this week, Jeremy, about does life have a purpose? Quite a deep question in between the players, <laughs> doctors and nurses, or whatever you play. <laughs> is there a God? Is another question. Sure Why does God allow pain and suffering? Is a question. <laughs> is Christianity too narrow? Is Jesus God? We've already discussed that one this morning. Is the Bible reliable? Yeah. Can I know God personally? So these are all questions, and I tell you what, for all of us in the room, if there is the opportunity to learn these, then one day, if you put yourself out there and share a copy with someone, you will find that these questions pop up time and time again. They're questions that we get asked in the cafe day in, day out, as people want to explore faith, want to learn more about Jesus, and these are what they would class as stumbling blocks. These are like, aha moments, I've got you now. Christianity is too narrow. It doesn't allow for everyone to do what they want, does it? Boom. What's your answer to that, Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. But, uh, yeah, you're probably right. But let me tell you about Jesus who died for your sins. <laughs> oh, he's got an answer. Go for it. I don't know what purpose means. Purpose. It means... Uh, Good question. What does purpose mean? Purpose means to do it with intent, to be really bold and courageous and give them something really good to answer with. So, how can we do it? Here's a really good acronym for all of us to learn. So when you are out doing personal evangelism, how many of us believe we've got two mouths and one ear? <laughs> Some of us have got the gift of God, we can talk for hours and hours and hours, and tell you all about this and tell you, oh, I te you know, I can wax lyrical about Cambridge United for minutes without taking a breath. And you guys would be so inspired about my love of football and for Cambridge United that you would all start following Cambridge United tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> the chances are you wouldn't, would you? Because some of you want to support other teams. And that's the same as Christianity, as far as I can see. If I tell you too much salt, too much about Jesus, 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 <coughs> you're going to start turning off, looking out the window, wanting to know when can I eat my biscuit, or can I eat the cake, uh, or I've got to go now. And it's exactly the same. So start a conversation with someone. Number one, start a conversation. Talk about the weather, talk about football, talk about whatever. But see if you can add a bit of gospel into that question. Number two, ask a question. I wonder if Jesus was alive, which football club he would support? You, you are. Manchester. <laughs> the bees. And then, number three, listen. See what they reply with. Just by that question, I've heard two or three different answers in the room of who Jesus would support if he was a football fan. <laughs> it's incredible what two ears does. Then... If you get a chance, tell your story. Tell your story, your testimony of how Jesus has impacted you. So start a conversation with someone. Chatty Cafe is really good at that. Start a conversation with someone. It could be about anything. Uh, grab their attention. Grab, a, grab their face. Grab their view. Grab whatever it is that is in them at this moment. And just give them the eye contact to listen. Ask the question. Listen to their answer tell your story. Can we remember the salt? Yeah. Such an easy thing to learn. Then we move on to number three, which is mass evangelism. I'm bringing this in. So mass evangelism is the proclamation, which is the sharing of all the gospel message to a group of people with the intent that the, that the individuals would come 
to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So this is mass evangelism, me preaching to you, going out on the streets on a soapbox and sharing the gospel with people is mass evangelism. Going to a big event like a big worship event or a big crusade where someone really famous is going to be talking about Jesus is mass evangelism, where we want to see as many people's lives transformed in one place at one time. This morning was mass evangelism with Izzy. Not only was it just personal evangelism, but she shared the gospel with about 10 children. They all did the sinner's prayer. And hallelujah, some of them this morning, I'm sure, gave their life to Jesus for the first time. Isn't that mass evangelism? If we went out and said, you know, 10 children gave their life to Jesus this morning, I bet you people would question us. But I tell you what, we saw 10 children. And when, when 30 or 40 of us saw 10 children make a commitment this morning to follow Jesus, that is beyond doubt that it is true. You cannot question when more than one person has physically seen something. When you have a witness report, they ask for witness statements, don't they? Did anyone witness that accident? Did anyone see what happened? Because witness statements are so important. So when we witness something incredible this morning, we want to go and tell others about it. You see, most businesses, apparently a chap called Peter Drucker said, most businesses know their customers well, but don't know their non-customers that well. Most businesses know their customers well, but don't know their non-customers that well. I wonder if church is the same. I know you guys very well. Most of you in this room I know very well. But at the same time, I don't know as much as I should do about those guys there. I don't know as much as I should do about the other businesses on Madford Lane. I don't know as much as I should do about the houses on Bouncer Lane. And that's just a confession this morning. You see, we all know people, but we, we, we know our people, but we don't know as much as we should about those outside. That is why we have the Gateway Centre. It is a place where people come and we can draw people in from the outside and we can help share the gospel to them in different ways. Sometimes it's conversations, sometimes it's pictures on the wall, sometimes it might be the cross, sometimes it might be the bit on the till receipt that says, don't worry, Jesus loves you. Whatever we can do to share the gospel in this project, and this is why we have been praying this week to remain in this project, because we see the impact that Jesus is doing on the community through this place. Mass evangelism in all of us will lead to personal evangelism, which then leads to internal evangelism. Because we have to start somewhere. And some of the stories of famous evangelists who've been saved have started by somebody inviting them to something. How bold are we in this room today to invite someone? And I want to make you all lay ministers in this room today. What is a lay minister? Well, a lay minister is someone who is not ordained, but still does ministry work. So we have a bunch of lay ministers already in this church. We have, on a Sunday, we have our youth and children's ministers. We have our um, people on the front door. We have people who lead worship. We have people who lead prayer times. We have um, people outside, people who go into prisons and, and to other places as hospitals, as chaplains. They are lay ministers. We have evangelists who go out on the streets. They are lay ministers. We have missionaries. Who are um, we have sometimes we have missionaries who come here. We have Keith who comes here. We have Sean and uh, her husband a few months back. We have uh, missions. We support Roy and Lainey in Hungary. We have missionaries who go out and share the good news in other places. We have pioneers, people who want to go and start new projects. These are all lay ministers. But I proclaim and I speak over every one of us in this room today. We are all able to be lay ministers this week. How can we be lay ministers? Three simple things. Jeremy, number one, let others know you go to church. Can we all do that? Mm -hmm. Number two, let others know that you are a Christian and it means something to you. And number three, loving people and caring for people. It's all it takes to be a lay minister. So let people know you go to church. Let others know that you are a Christian and it means something to you. You don't just go to church because you have to or you're forced to, but you like going to church because they do good things in church and it makes you feel better. And then, love people. Remember your SALT acronym? acronym? Remember it? What was SALT representing? Sorry? Stand 
start the conversation. Start the conversation. Ask, ask, ask the question. Listen. listen and tell the story. See, we can all do that, can't we? And then this leads to other conversations. So I anoint you all as lay ministers in this place today to go out and start a conversation with someone this week. Who fancies a little bit of activism now? Right. Matthew 28, 19, 20 says, Go forth, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Right, we're going to do some activity now. Who is bold and courageous in this room? Yes. 